Okay, hello everyone. It's Switzerland, so it means we need to start exactly um, one second after 2.30. Um, so, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Grzegorz Piwowarek, and I'm really happy that I can be here with you for the third time uh, in a row. Vox Day Strick turned out to be one of my favorite spots to uh, stick onto. Um, I am one of the lead backend engineers uh, for Casumo on Malta. Um, I'm also I'm doing trainings for company like Bottega IT Mines. Um, you might have uh, ended up e on my blog for comprehension.com. Besides this, I contribute to open source and try to write some stuff. So let's go straight to the topic of today. It will be Java 8. Wow, I see no enthusiasm. It's been on. Well, that's mostly because Java 8 has been on uh, a hot topic for the last five years. Um, this was actually a very special release, because this is the, the first one when actually Java officially um, gravitated towards the functional programming. Um, so it turns out that everyone was super happy about this one, super excited. Finally, Lambdas, no more Guava. Finally. Um, functional interfaces, streams, parallel streams, all of that. And everyone wanted to migrate as fast as possible to, to Java 8. But then Java started moving forward. We ended up with Java 9. And the biggest feature of Java 9 was modularity. And it turned out that the people were not that eager to migrate. It turns out that Java 8 was so successful, brought so many improvements that Actually, most of us didn't feel like we need to migrate forward. Let's do a quick, quick test. Who of you is on Java 11? OK, quite a lot. Java 9? OK, I will raise my hand for all options because we have microservices and all possible versions of Java, probably. OK, Java 7? OK, Java 8? OK, most of you. <laughs> Java 4? That happens. OK, but if you look like at statistical data provided by Mario, this is the current state of adoption of Java 9 in the ecosystem. So as you can see, most of you. <laughs> I think that most of people that are on Java 11 now, like me, are, are, I'm not there because of modularity anyway. I mean, I'm on Java 11 because of Java 11, and I have other stuff, but I really don't care about modularity. So the real question would be, do you care about modularity? Personally, not that much, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, so, but there's been a very big change in the world of Java, because so far we've been waiting multiple years always for the big bang release. So in Java 8, those were Lambda streams and functional programming incorporated. Java 9 was about modularity. Java, Java 7 was about strings in switch expressions, I think. That was the big feature of that time. Um, but nowadays, Java needed to move forward faster. So they adopted new cadence-driven uh, release cycle. So in the past, they would cook up on the side these big lambda things, those big JPMS, and wait with all small releases till this big feature is ready. And as you all know, that kind of slow down the progress. So we moved forward a bit, um, and now we have the cadence-driven development uh, release cycle, which means that the new release of Java is happening every six months, regardless, e even if there are no features ready, most likely. Um, so as you can see, um, Java 10 wasn't that beefy as Java 9. Java 11 was even less beefier than Java 10. Java 12 is even less beefier than um, Java 11. And this is very good, because this, is, this, is why, this, is, uh, this allows all those small things to make it into Java without waiting next 10 years till they figure out how to do value types, for example. By the way, today is 19th of March. Java 12 gets released, if you didn't know. Hooray. Um, so, but besides the um, new uh, six months release cadence, there's been one big change. So now we have not all, let's say, Java releases are made equal now. We have long-term support releases and minor ones. And long-term support releases are like Java 7, Java 8, Java 11, 
which was released six months ago. And Java 12 and all subsequent releases up to Java 17 will be feature ones, which means they, they will be supported only for six months. And it's not that important to migrate onto them. So if you feel comfortable with Java 11, feel free to stick to them. But if you migra migrate beyond that, be ready to keep migrating every six months till the next release cycle. Or just roll it back to the, to the uh, last uh, long-term release. So once we know that all of this is happening, let's go to the main part of, the, of today's show, which is um, the Java rant. Um, so pretty much today we'll go through six or seven quirks, implementation, inter interesting implementation details um, that you'd rather want to know. So let's start very slow. Conditional stream termination. Um, very, very simple operation. Probably by now most of you are familiar with how streams work, so we won't go into details. Um, but imagine a very simple scenario. You have a list of date objects. And let's say that y your domain knowledge or allows you to, or the, no the context knowledge allows you to tell to, to figure out that they are actually ordered. And we have a very simple task. We want to take all dates before a certain date. So what do we do? We have Streams API. And this is pretty easy, because we leverage the declarative approach. We, we stream the dates. We declaratively say, give us all dates before um, the 4th of April. Um, then do something with those dates, and maybe print them out. And this will actually work. But what's the problem here? Do you know? This will actually evaluate the, the whole stream because the stream, in this case, doesn't know that, the, that there is an ordering in place. It doesn't know that as soon as you encounter the first uh, non-matching case, all other will also fail by, by definition. Um, so it turns out that this is uh, quite inefficient, because we could short-circuit the whole operation quite, quite early, but we keep evaluating all of them to make sure that, oh, maybe after 2012, you know, far, b far into the future, there's uh, some years backwards. Well, it might happen if your if you're int overflows, but I think it's not about this. Um, additionally, this won't work with infinite streams. So imagine that you are composing infinite operations. You want to short circuit them, um, and this won't work because it will just keep evaluating all the things, well, till infinity. Not ideal. Um, so actually, let's see what's going on in there. Uh, we can do this by using the, the peak method, which means we can have a look what's actually going through the stream. And in this particular case, you can see that actually we could have stopped processing all of that after three items, but we still keep doing that. Um, and this is not ideal, uh, not, not a tragedy as well, but it's an important thing to know. And here comes the JDK9, which brings a very small and very handy improvement in a form of take-while, drop-while methods, which provide exact semantics that we are looking for in this particular case. Um, but if you want to uh, leverage the same in JDK 8, well, you don't have an option for that. You need to give up on Streams API and go back to loops, um, which probably you might not want. But if you really want to use Streams API with limits that might end up with infinite sequences, it's always a good idea to use at least put a very high limit on that so that your application doesn't crash. So now, once we end up in Java 9, now this is very easy to refactor. You replace the filter method with take while. And as you can see, we, we get exact semantics we are after in this scenario. Um, so the stream will terminate as soon as the first mismatch is encountered. Okay. All good? Are we on the same page? Perfect. It's a very easy example, but I introduced here for a very specific purpose, um, because it will complicate something in the future, um, and you will see in a second. So let's move on slowly to my favorite part, which is stream flat math method, which is, let's say, um, broken in JDK 8. 
So to, to give you a um, required context, you need to know that streams are not proper collections. This is, this is a concept that borrows ideas from the concept of lazy sequences. Um, and the lazy evaluation of elements that are inside allows them to, for example, work with infinite, infinite sequences. But also leveraging lazy evaluation uh, makes it as performant as the imperative equivalent regarding time complexity. Um, at least in theory. Because if you see an uh, example like that, you might say, I mean, at least some years ago, it was very common to, to hear um, that, OK, it's nice and readable. I like it. Uh, but Grzegorz, look, if I write the same using a few nested for loops and then uh, if else, I will leverage lazy semantics. It means that as soon as I get the first value that matches my criteria, I can break out and stop evaluating. And this is a false assumption, because if you know how streams work internally, they will actually they should work exactly in a, this way. Um, so there is no trade-off. There should be no trade-off between those two approaches. But when working with Java 8, it turned out that actually this is not the case, that there is a very interesting quirk that you should be all aware of, especially if you, want to, if you plan on standing, uh, staying in Java 8 for a long time. So let's have a look at a very simple example. Um, we have a very simple list list containing users, and this user contains um, addresses. To make life simple, let's co make those addresses just A1, A2, A3, something. Um, and our task is to take a first encountered address of a first encountered user. So what do we do? We create a stream, we flat map it to the stream of addresses and find first. So we know at this point that streams API is lazy should be lazy. So which means what should happen right here is the stream API should take the first element of the list. In this case, it's a user containing all those addresses. Then take the first element of the nested collection, which means addresses of that particular user, and then immediately return the first element using the find any. Right? This is how it works. You agree? So let's actually see what happens. Let's add uh, the pick. And let's see what elements go through the stream instance. And this is when it gets really scary. Because if you look, it turns out that actually all stream, all elements from the nested collections go straight for the stream. Although the, the result will be correct, but the whole collection will be evaluated eagerly for no reason. Because if you use find any, you know that there is no option, that you, you are not interested in subsequent elements. So all this goes into waste. Um, and yes, it's been recognized as a bug, but um, not worth ad addressing for JDK 9. So it's been there for quite a while. And to give you an example of how bad it can look like, imagine this simple operation. You have, we get, um, we stream users, we take all addresses, we want to take the first one, um, and let's profile the application, the, this application. Um, in normal scenarios, if you try to profile a simple application consisting only of that single method, that would end up really quickly, OK, in milliseconds in most cases. But assuming that get all addresses is infinite, we end up in this crazy situation where it ends up evaluating, evaluating, evaluating. And then it's broken. It never ends. Um, so it's really terrible. And you need to be aware of that, because you might, you, well, your application might not break, but at least might be very inefficient because of that. Um, but it can get much worse, because imagine that your stream gets more complex. Let's say we add uh, another map call straight after this. So let's say you want to pick the first user, you ping the first address, and you do something with it. Let's say you make an HTTP call or something very expensive. Um, and it turns out that all those subsequent items will be also mapped along the way. So as you can see, the performance impact is it can, can be really drastic. And if not performance impact, if you have infinite stream, that will hold, hold, uh, stop your application from working at, at all. And what's the cost of that? Um, 
if you jump into the details, implementation details of how stream IPI works, you will see this nice class. Um, and if you jump into the relevant part, you will see that whenever there is, um, I don't think I can point right there, but somewhere along this side, there is something like, you can see sequential and forage, uh, which means that if you encounter a flat map, internally it will be eagerly just for each, um, which means all items will be evaluated. Additionally, you can see there's a sequential keyword, which means that if you thought that you can use parallel strings for that, no, because they will be serialized at this particular uh, point in time. So that's not cool, but we can fix it. How? We can implement our, our, our own split iterator based lazy flat map. Okay, that, that's pretty easy. It takes a bit of code. Um, that's probably a bit blurred image, don't worry. I don't understand it as well. Um, you can do that, but again, that's, that's, that's a thing that you get for free. If you keep up to date with, Java, with, those, with those minor Java releases, because finally, this was addressed as a bug in JDK 10, and finally it's solved, and we don't want need to experience those kind of problems anymore. Um, but if you still want to stay on JDK 8, um, well, you can't use Streams API for that if this is, this is a problematic. Go back to your old fancy loops, because there is no other way. Well, if you happen to be on Java JDK 9, and you shouldn't because it's not supported an anymore, you have the same problem because it wasn't recognized as a problem for a very long time. Okay, so here comes JDK 9. Remember, take while, drop while. It solves the problems with lack of short circuiting of filter operation. So let's do a quick test. We are on JDK 9. We have a nested list of lists. The first nested list is 1, 2. The second one is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let's flat map it. Mario, what will be the result if you, if you flat map two nested lists and print the result? It will print all the items. Okay, it will print all the, all the items, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. As easy as it is. Okay, let's start another quiz. Now we have a flat stream containing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we take while all elements till you encounter a four and then try to print them out. What do we get? Mario, tell me. Uh, I do, uh, one, two, one, two, three. Perfect, yeah. As easy as pi. Okay, and now let's combine those two operations together. Okay. And what do we get now? You tell me, Mario. Tell me, what do we get? Those are ex to, there is no trick in here. Those are two operations that we had a look just combined together into a single stream operation. In theory, we should get one, two, three. Okay, and what do we get? One, two, three, five, six, seven. Make sense? Surprise. So, unfortunately, this, this stuff happens. And if you, I mean, you can see those bugs getting, uh, getting reported. Sometimes they get, there is some dispute regarding this is really a mistake. I, if we ever promise that flat map results in an ordered, um, in ordered items and so on, but this is something you should be aware of. Personally, it's a disappointment because um, this is not how it works in other languages. So this is very, this is, this is really scary. Um, but again, there is a pragmatic solution to that. Either you rewrite, write, you write your own split iterators and pretty much rewrite your own stream API, or just migrate to a newer Java where it got fixed. Well, JDK 10, let's say, brought local variable type inference. M you might not like it, but along this, you get a set of very small and interesting improvements. That's worth uh, to keep in mind. Okay, let's move forward to lambda expressions versus checked exceptions. Um, as you know, the, the way that lambdas were implemented in Java 8 they were based on the idea that we've been using in Java for very quite, quite a long time. We actually had lambdas in Java before Java 8. They were just very ugly, because we would need to create an anonymous inner function, instantiate it and pass it over. That were probably the beefiest lambdas in the world uh, regarding the programming languages. But using the, reusing this idea, leveraging uh, backwards compatibility, 
um, was quite tricky and I really like it. So whenever you have lambdas in Java, they are backed by functional interfaces that you can find in Java Util function. Um, but there is a small problem with them. Uh, as you can, if you look at the method signature apply, it doesn't de define any exception, any checked exceptions. And this is generally a good thing, uh, but it leads to certain problems. And if you ever used Streamius API, if you use Lambda expressions, you know how it is whenever the uh, checked exception happen in a body, especially in a long chain stream, that starts looking like this. And bye-bye readability and conciseness. It's all gone right now. But it can get even worse. Um, if you, let's say, if you don't care about any of these exceptions along the way, let's say you care that the whole stream froze. If, if, you, if, if you care, if the whole stream froze exception somewhere along the side, then you add one more. Um, try catch. Yeah, so concise, uh, much readable. Um, and the solution for that is you can, you can pretty much encapsulate all of that logic and provide utility methods that allow you to do that. Um, I've done that a long time ago. It works, although it's pretty much doing the same, the same stuff as here, just swiping them, swap, swiping the exceptions under, uh, under the carpet. Um, but helps uh, with certain stuff. But now, there's an interesting part because, you know, when we're discussing bugs with flat map, problems with, with order, order um, there were always someone saying that, oh, we, we promise nothing. So let's play for a second. Let's imagine we are Oracle lawyers and let's jump straight into JLS and start reading what's in there. And you can find a very interesting note regarding how type inference works in Java 8 for, uh, for exceptions. Um, so, a bound of the form force alpha is purely informational. It directs resolution to optimize the instantiation of alpha so that it's possible, if possible, it's not a checked exception type. So, in other words, for every t in t extends furable, this will be generously inferred to be a runtime exception um, to simplify certain, uh, certain case scenarios like, like for example, um, inferring an exception type from an empty lambda body. But once we know that, let's put that into practice. So we can create a simple static method called, for example, refrow. We, put an, we accept an exception and just refrow it. All good, no compiler errors, right? Let's introduce a generic type. Okay, so, we, so now the method is parameterized with a type T that extends exception, and now we have a problem. We, we can't refrow um, because there's an unhandled exception he, in, the, in the body. So what do we do if types don't match? Well, we cast it, right? Okay, we cast it, and now the compiler doesn't complain anymore. And this is how we can actually throw checked exceptions in, since Java 8 uh, without compiler noticing, because the compiler will infer those to be runtime exceptions. Um, so now you can just throw it, no one complains, it's fine, right? Let's put that into practice. Um, so if we are in the world of Java and we complain about lambda expressions being overly uh, verbose regarding exception handling, now we can handle that. We can, for example, create our own uh, type that throws an exception, okay? Now it's possible to use it as a target for lambda expressions that throw exceptions. Pretty cool, but now, we could create another method, static one, that will pretty much serve as an adapter layer between um, the new type and the old one. And now, internally, we just try cache an exception, reuse our method that allows us to trick the compiler, and just use it. Okay? No checked exceptions, hell. That's all. I do understand that we might have gone through this quite quickly, so if you want to follow up, there's, there's a link. I described the whole process in, in detail if you want to go straight into that. But there is one note to keep in mind that um, this is somehow playing with the, with the rules, like trying to find the gaps in the rules. So use, so I didn't, I didn't show you this. Let's move forward to another um, problem that I see with, uh, with Java 8, which was kind of 
a bit of a disappointment for, uh, for a long time and still is. Um, so I remember that when Java 8 was announced and except introducing the Lambda expressions and stream-like APIs for Java, there was a big promise of making parallel processing easy. So you might have been hearing for a very long time from many different sources that concurrency, parallelism, those all the stuff is very hard, right? But suddenly it turns out that it's not. You just need one keyword to make things run in parallel, right? That's very, that's very easy, very convenient. So if we can do this legally, well, why not just replace all our stream instances with parallel streams, right? and benefit from infinite performance. Why not? It turns out it's not that good idea um, because the multiple questions slowly arise. So for example, well, you run them in parallel, but where? Okay, because co code is run in the, let's say in the main thread, but you need more threads to run those things in parallel. So where are they taken from? Well, what's the pool? Okay, where are they run? Okay, in the cloud, serverless, or what? Blockchain? Um, or maybe <coughs> if they actually run somewhere, probably it would be a very handy, a possibility to have, to actually be able to provide your own custom thread pool that would be tuned for your needs with the proper Q size, with a proper minimal, let's say, minimal core size, maximum core size, uh, maybe your own uncut exception handlers. Um, but it turns out it's not possible. Also, by the way, what's the maximum number of tasks executed in parallel? Let's say I have a collection of 1,000 elements, and I do stream par parallel on that. How many do get run in parallel? Two? 1,000? What if we pass an infinite stream and make it parallel, will it run with infinite parallelism? I have no idea. By the way, don't try that. I recently broke our Jenkins, uh, Jenkins setup on production by playing with Groovy uh, Jenkins Pipelines DSL. I tried to parallelize the pipelines and I ended up in a recursive script, which ended up, I ended up, in other words, spawning infinite, infinitely long pipeline run in infinite in parallel. Not the fun stuff. Um, so the other questions also arise. So and suddenly it, there are no easy answers to that. But we can inspect the code of Stream API and see what's going on in there. And it turns out that all of those tasks are run on a common shared fork join pool. And this is one. There is one single pool that's shared by all parallel stream instances that you have in your application. That pool will be also used by compatible future instances if you don't provide your own custom pool. Moreover, if you have an application server and you run multiple applications on that, you might have even more problems because it will be all shared. So the fork join pool is a very interesting concept. Um, it works really great when playing with CPU intensive jobs. It's also a basis, if you don't know, for the Akka uh, framework for, for Scala. However, I haven't seen this in like business case scenario used in production, never. We know that it's a fork pool, but the interesting part of that is that we know this only by, by inspecting the code. So it's an implementation detail that we can't really rely upon. And it turns out that the thread pool that is used uh, for execution of pair of streams is undefined. So it's run somewhere. But since we inspected the implementation details of Stream API. Now we know that it's a fork join pool. And now we can go through the fork join API and see that actually if you use manually core, call a fork method, it will actually run the, it, you will kind of, hi, you can hijack the tasks. So if you run your own parallel streams in your own fork join pool, I mean within your own fork join pool, those effectively will be hijacked and run on your own. But there's another problem. So for the fork join pool to work efficiently, the parallelism need to be uh, figure, figure, uh, derived from the number of cores on your, process, uh, on your machine. And if you do something like this, it turns out that the parallelism, like the, per the, the, person, the parallelism is broken 
because the task submitted to that foreground pool will be submitted as this foreground pool had the same parallelism specified as the shared one. And that was the case till the JDK 10, where it actually got fixed. So even if you, see, if, if you are looking, fig trying to figure out how to submit your own, uh, use your own thread pool for parallel streams, most answers on Stack Overflow will be simply wrong. I mean, they will work, but probably not that good as you would expect them. Well, at least if you are before JDK 10. This is a small thing, but got fixed later on. So if you actually, if you look at, for example, settings, uh, you can set something like parallelism, you can set your own thread factory, and code exception handler as for all thread pools, and async mode. I have no idea what async mode, don't ask me. Um, and this is, usually, you would like to be able to configure more than that. Um, and if you, if, if you ever looked into how foreground pool is instantiated, you can see that there is quite a lot of private constructors that have mu much richer API, where you can set much more things. But they are hidden, so you shouldn't use them. But again, this is where JDK 9 jumps into and gives you new constructors with way more uh, possibilities to adjust and fine-tune your foreground pool. Um, but to be fully candid, remember that if you want to leverage those tricks for streams API, um, for parallel streams API, you need to be aware that this is a still uh, implementation trick, and if you migrate, something might get broken. So it's important to keep that in mind. And lastly, whenever you are going parallel, it's very important e to actually follow up and figure out if this will bring something. It has its own cost. Um, so for example, let's take this very simple example. You have a case where you have, let's say, when you just stream an array, you replace each element with a random next int. I know it's not very practical. Then collect it. And you can do the same with sequential and parallel just by adding one keyword. Which one will be faster? In this case, um, in this case, it turns out that actually sequential is much faster than parallel um, because of how random instances are constructed internally, leveraging compare and swaps, which, are, which, which tend to be much slower if you have high contention. Um, so it's very important to follow up, actually, what are you to know what you are doing and replacing parallel, uh, parallel streams with um, normal streams with parallel streams in your application randomly. It's a, it's a very bad idea. I actually wrote a library recently that addresses this problem, a set of parallel, parallel collectors for Java Stream API. Um, but also, whenever I put a note there that be very careful, don't use it, don't try to fix n plus ones with parallel, parallelism, don't try to fix other stuff, because usually there are easier and cheaper ways. Let's move forward. Let's, let's move away from parallel streams and focus on, well, almost move away from parallel streams. So let's focus on stream generate. Um, let's look at its documentation. So as you can see, it returns an infinitely, infinite sequential unordered stream where each element is generated by the provided supplier. And it's quite easy. So let's try to see it in practice. So let's say we can generate an infinite stream providing constant values. So in this case, we want to have an uh, infinite stream um, supplying only 42s along the way. And it's very easy. We leverage stream generate. We provide a supplier that returns 42. And it goes on and on and on and on. We could do the same with stream generate. Uh, stream generate and random, let's say. We want to generate stream of random values. And that's, a, that's possible as well. Works really fine. Um, but it gets more interesting if you, let's say, want to involve some form of a state in there. So maybe, let's say, you don't want to generate random values. You don't want to generate, you know, constant streams. That's, that, that's boring. Let's introduce some, some state in there and make the supplier a bit more beefier. So it's a very simple case scenario here. We want to return, um, let's say, create generate a sequence from zero up to infinity, and then limit to eight items. And this works, okay? 
everything fine. There are easier ways of achieving this, but it works. Um, but what if we go in parallel now? Okay, we add the one magical keyword, we start, we play, uh, we, we press play, what happens? Wow, we are out of order, totally. Anyway, why is that? Obviously, that implementation is not thread safe, right? Because we have, we don't have atomi atomicity on int operations, so let's fix that. Let's make the stateful supplier thread safe by introducing atomic integer. Okay, all good. What will we get now if we play it back? Okay, almost good. We are still out of order. So you might be thinking, I mean, this is, this is what I see qui quite a lot. So s whenever you see a tutorial about a stream generate, people often try to implement custom stateful uh, suppliers. Um, and this is wrong by design. Uh, but before uh, we go into details, let's actually put a peak method over there and a very short limit. So li let's see what actually happens. What do you think? How many elements go through stream instance in that case? Well, you might guess that it's not four. Um, so whenever something like this happens, especially in the context of stream generate, well, how parallel streams work? They will split it into a few different operations going in parallel. And there is no synchronization between them. So it's perfectly possible that once they work in parallel, they will evaluate more elements than, than you want. And then they get stitched together, and as soon as they figure out, oh, that we have more than needed, then they cut off. So we get a really crazy result over there. And to be fully candid, that's n absolutely not a problem with uh, stream generate. The documentation could be a little bit more verbose, but this is mostly how, uh, how we used it. And there is one very important keyword to remember there. So the f in the very first sentence of the documentation, it's written explicitly, returns an infinite sequential unordered stream. And this means that even in the single threaded scenarios, we can't count on the, uh, on the order there. It, well, given the current implementation, in most likely, it will work. 99.9% percent of times. But it's important to remember that there is no contract enforcing actually this particular behavior. This, this is how it turns out to be implemented. So whenever you want to generate sequences and this kind of stuff, you, you don't use stream generate. Stream generate is great for, stat, uh, for constant streams, for random streams. But if you want to log form logical order sequences, you have stream iterate for that, and this will maintain the order. Okay, and we are slowly moving to the last part of today, which is optional versus option, or optional versus rest of the world. Um, so if you've been um, working in the Java since ever and not exposed to other languages like, Has uh, like Scala, for example, um, then you might be very surprised in what I show you right now. But for people that's been working in Scala, and jumped into Java and saw how optional is implemented, what semantics it adds. That's also very surprising and scary. So let's take this very simple example. We have a user. We want to create an optional of it and then map it to get its address. And now imagine a situation that get address returns a null. What will happen? What will happen if this code gets run? Nothing will happen. Nothing will get printed out because the optional Java, Java interpretation of the option concept actually adds a certain context to the, null, the, to the null. It means that whenever you have a null in a map or flat map, um, it will be interpreted as optional empty. And it might make a lot of sense because, well, optional is supposed to protect us from nullability, from null pointer exceptions. Um, so it makes sense that if it sees nulls, it replaces it with an optional empty. Yes, uh, that kind of makes sense, but you need to be aware that the null, it would be really, I mean, such kind of semantics would be fine in a world where the null wouldn't exist. But we are introducing an optional concept to the world of Java, where null is the first class citizen. So suddenly, interpreting null 
as an optional empty can bring multiple problems. And we've been beaten by them on production. Um, so, and this is the part actually where there is a lot of confusion because in Scala it's valid to put a null into a sum. And it makes sense because value, null, can have different meaning than simply uh, an, an absence. And it's up to us, but optional could be able to give you this choice, but now it's not there. So imagine this very simple example. You have two cases. You have, uh, this is a very common problem, very common issue in production. So you do a refactor. Let's say you don't have proper test coverage. You replace map, let's say, in a, in a stream consisting, let's say, of mixes of composition of optionals and streams. You replace an order of map methods. And suddenly, the value is totally different. Because in this first example, let's say that your handle address method is perfectly fine accepting nulls. It knows how to handle that. But now, if you move it below the find any call and make it an optional map call, suddenly this null will never make it there. So you can get drastically different results. And there is no solution for that. You need to be aware how it works in Java and be prepared to see that it works in a bit different way in other languages that you, that you move on to. Um, so this has been a very f f famous case uh, for us. So if you go to waivers, uh, waiver chat on Gitter, there are from time to time appearing people and asking why waiver option allows nulls being inside. Um, well, because it's polite and allows you to do your choice how you handle null and not. Um, so this creates a lot of confusion and you need to be aware how it works. Uh, I hope it helps. So this is how we are approaching the end of this, on, of this talk. And the point of this talk, I mean, I've been ranting a bit about Java for like 42 minutes right now. But the point is not complain about Java, not telling you to move to Kotlin Scala immediately. Uh, but actually, the, my point was that it's worth paying attention to those small Java releases and not ignoring them. Because most of those issues that I've mentioned today, they got fixed along the way um, with those small, st small releases every six months that you might not even notice because they were in the shadow of some big feature that was shipped along the way. Um, also, read the documentation. That helps a lot. Thank you very much. We have question time. Yes, I've been to Lucas' yeah. presentation, and actually this is an example that I always throw during trainings that I do, and this is always confusing, because we go through optional stream, we use map and flat map, and then, okay, people just throw away all you earned, the, all, all that you learned, because now you have computable future that have then compose async, then run something, and that's really confusing. I'm not sure why they went this way, um, but yes, I fully agree with that. Yeah. A bit with the confusion of uh, of something. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the the flat map behavior was uh, in the stream was a bit uh, a bit uh, unexpected, of course. But I believe that also somewhere the naming convention uh, helped with the, the confusion. Of the, of the yes, I fully agree that naming naming confusion in the API contributes to the overall problem. Uh, one thing that I heard, I don't know if it's true, so don't quote me on that, but then the way that the optional is named optional and not option because it was not supposed to be an option, but was supposed to be something like 
option like. So they called it optional. I don't know if this is true, but this, this is what I heard the gossip about. And this is why it gave it a little bit different semantics. It might be just an excuse, but that's, that's what I heard. So again. But on the other hand, please let's not just just run to the bugs at the the, the, the bugs um, issue tracker and let's just just scream at developers because they do an incredibly good job and need to take into consideration way more beyond if this feature makes sense or not, but take into consideration then the whole future of the language. So although I complain about this, I totally respect the work they did there because it's incredibly hard once you try to develop a library. And not even a library, but um, the base of your language. Uh, that's the core part of your language. And for to, um, so the question was, if it's possible to still to kind of have both, to stay on the older Java and have new updates. Um, the answer, mean, I mean, if this is a bug in the JVM itself, then probably most cases no. You might be able to switch to another implementation of the JVM that doesn't have certain problems, which is fine. Um, but regarding the libraries, there is no way to use new versions of the that, that's been brought to future, the future versions of Java. What you can do, you can use some external libraries that provide similar functionality, but there is no way to have both, to stay, to stay with the old stuff and have new IP APIs in there, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much and see you next year, hopefully.